This is InfoSec Decoded, number 83, the warp bubble. And uh, I was surprised to find this. Tesla makes solar panels, which I didn't know. I knew they made the Powerball, but they make solar panels and apparently they make lousy ones. They, the whistleblower was fired after complaining that they were unsafe and they are indeed remarkably unsafe. They have set fire to like seven uh, Walmarts and other companies for using Tesla solar panels. They overheat and, and cause fires. So there's going to be an investigation from the SEC over that. Securities and Exchange Commission. I'm not quite sure why they would be the ones to investigate it, They're not like the FTC or something. But anyway, um, apparently there's a serious problem with them and they've been doing the wrong thing to cover it up. And speaking about the Texas electric grid, there's a lot of Bitcoin miners moving into Texas now. And Ted Cruz has agreed with them that Bitcoin miners are going to help fix the Texas grid, which is kind of interesting. And I realized I must have taken brain damage because this Bitcoin stuff is starting to make sense to me. Um, their point is when you make a power grid, you can't really store it anywhere. So you have to use it right away. And so if the demand goes up and down, you're, there's, there's frequently times in Texas when the cost of power is negative. They'll pay you to use it because they have too much power. And so if they could have a customer who would pay them something for using power and also accept being cut off like within a second when they say, and just run when there's excess power, that would be beneficial to them rather than having to somehow try to slow down the machines. Anyway, so they claim that having Bitcoin miners around who will pay you for power and accept having it cut off at random will actually stabilize the grid. And this is, of course, a substitute for the Texas grid being connected to the U.S. Uh, national grid, which is the way other people do it, you even it up by averaging over a larger area. So anyway, that's the plan. They're claiming Bitcoin miners are actually helpful for the Texas grid. Uh, we'll see what comes of that. Anyway, Caitlin has got AIs doing math. Yes. Uh, so there's an article by sciencealerts.com um, by David Neld, Neld. Uh, talking about how AI is starting to actually do some of the pure mathematics that a lot of science fiction authors thought maybe might happen in the future. So the idea is that AI would come along, be smarter than us, and, and start doing the science and mathematics and figuring out parts of the universe we couldn't figure out because we were just too dumb. And this is starting to happen. So um, basically what the what the team did is they, they used something called DeepMind, which is used for things like weather forecasts, and they applied it to mathematical problems that are haven't been solved. So in particular, it solved, it made a proof for the uh, uh, kajtan lustig polynomials, which is a math problem that has remained unsolvable for 40 years. And this AI came along and figured out a proof for it. Um, and it's supposedly, done a, it's supposedly also figured out a few other proofs, which is, Absolutely fantastic. So anyway, the computers are coming and they're going to take all our jobs and they're going to do all our research and there's nothing less left for us to do anymore. So congratulations. So we will lounge around on couches, eating peeled grapes and composing poetry. Yes. And they will take over all our cybersecurity and, and they will take over all world um, politics and militaries. Oh, uh, that would, yeah. it, it could be a glorious utopia. It certainly will be, especially yep, when, when the AIs come and they convince us that we need to put all the nuclear codes in their capable hands, then we'll, we'll be in a perfect place. I saw that movie. Yes. <laughs> all right. And Alan has got the, uh, the mask research. Yes. It's become a fixation of mine once again. It's, so I think I'm we're delivered. all fixated on this these days. <laughs> like COVID <laughs> and what you should do about it. Yeah, yeah, it's cut into my sleep just a little bit. Um, the anxiety over it all. Um, but I have another public service announcement, this time about masking. There is a study that has been published uh, very recently in the PNAS, Proceedings of the National Academy of Sciences, by uh, a number of authors, uh, academic authors, and they've written a research article entitled An Upper Bound on One-to-One -one Exposure to Infectious Human Respiratory Particles. 
Well, you can tell it's good science because you can't understand a word of it. Exactly. And I have to say, uh, this article has especially good writing. Um, it is quite dense and they have their own special lingo. I uh, skimmed through the whole thing looking for the punchline, but there was no punchline. It well, was just baffling chart after baffling chart. No, no, they do have a few good charts, actually. Uh, okay. They have two really good charts. And what they were doing in the study was looking at face mask efficacy. And there have been a bunch of studies looking at face mask efficacy in one way or another, but um, this one's one of the better ones. And what they were doing was looking at how well face masks perform, different types of face masks perform, and how good the filtration is, and how, how, uh, how much exposure to different people wearing different types or the same types of face masks how much exposure one infected uh, one person would subject the uninfected person to. Is it experimental or was it like a computer simulation? Because the graphs I saw looked too smooth. Uh, well, what they did was uh, test out with machines, test out different types of masks. And so then they put them in like a wind tunnel or something and blow dust on them? I don't know the details actually yeah. of this one, but there is technology to do that kind of thing. Mm -hmm. um, to um, either have people uh, talk and cough into a hood or to have uh, mannequin heads do more or less the same thing. And, and they can measure both inhalation and exhalation. Mm -hmm. So inwards penetration or inwards leakage and outward leakage. Mm -hmm. And uh, no surprise here, they found that FFP2 masks, which are the European equivalent to N95 masks, are far more effective than surgical masks. And uh, they didn't even bother to test out cloth masks because we all know that cloth masks are less effective than surgical masks, or at least I hope we know that. What's the difference between a cloth mask? What is a surgical mask? Are those those white paper ones people are wearing? Uh, yes, or blue paper ones. Oh, okay. Or purple, yes, exactly. Those things are not as good as N95s. Not nearly as good because they have a lot of inward leakage. Okay. This is the problem is that they do not form a good seal around the face. Mm -hmm. And um, although the material is pretty good, apparently, in many of the surgical masks, it's really all about the seal. And I see so many people with improperly fitted surgical masks, the big yeah. gap around the nose, mm -hmm. um, a lot of uh, airspace around the sides and the cheeks and uh, FFPs and or N95s are designed to create an airtight seal around the face and the nose. And so not only is the material better, but the seal is better. And in this test, they also applied uh, double-sided adhesive tape, special adhesive tape for uh, better sticking down the edges of the FFP2 masks and 95 masks and found that, that actually makes a big difference. Really big I think difference. so, yeah. Yeah. Um, and there's also a difference in how well the uh, mask is fitted, professionally fitted to the wearer. So um, they found that if both people, both the infected person and the non-infected person are wearing FFP2s, let's say N95s, the chance of infection is very low. It's very low. Mm -hmm. But if the uh, both people are wearing only surgical masks, uh, risks are far greater. Um, they are uh, almost uh, 100 times greater. Oh. Now, I, I thought they said that even if you're wearing sloppy, ill-fitting masks, it's better than no mask at all. This is true, yes. And they, they make it very clear that even a poorly fitted uh, N95 FFP2 mask is still much more effective than a surgical mask. Okay. Well, this is fitting what I've heard like Dr. Fauci and stuff say is you really ought to get a better mask. Yeah, uh, but there's still a widespread problem with um, medical health authorities not acknowledging airborne spread and not providing pr appropriate guidance. Well, I was listening to Mehdi Hassan yesterday, and he was giving the World Health Organization leader grief because they've still left up tweets from like a year ago saying N95 is not airborne. Yes. 
And those tweets are still being cited by various health agencies around the world, like uh, India still has guidance um, mm. or is continuing to release guidance that says very explicitly, COVID is not airborne. Yeah, so. that's pretty gruesome. You would like to think that the official medical authorities would at least tell you the truth. Yeah, I think at some point there needs to be a history written on the medical dogma and the medical politics that have prevented an acknowledgement that uh, COVID is airborne because um, the director of the WHO um, in February of 2020 said that it's likely airborne. Yeah. And then it promptly got dropped. The topic got dropped and then the fixation shifted to hand washing and sanitization of surfaces. See, I remember the arguments at that time when he said is if it was airborne, that would make mitigation very expensive. So we have right. to like not go there because then we couldn't open any businesses at all and it would trash the economies and stuff. Yeah. And, and that seems to be the, the, the political motivation, I guess, is that it's going to be too expensive to upgrade air filtration and it's going to require more lockdowns. And yeah, well, and I've seen... Uh, I've seen the right wingers, anti-vaxxers, you know, talking about why they hate Fauci. And the problem is there's some truth there. Like originally they told us not to use masks, not because the masks don't work, but because they wanted to serve the masks for the healthcare workers. And they didn't tell us that. They just told us don't wear masks, they don't work. Yeah. And that was a pretty rotten thing to do. And then they've changed the recommendations many times and been unclear many times. So if you're in a bad mood and you want to believe that the government is just jerking you around, you could come to that conclusion. This is true, yeah. And I, I do think that Fauci and the US government, CDC have some blame in all of this. Um, and they screwed but, up making the tests and we still don't have tests available easily. Right. <laughs> when the rest of the world, they just mail the tests to your house for free, you've got them right there. Yeah, yeah. And they're expensive here. Yeah. Whereas they're dirt cheap, if not free. And, and as far as I can tell, we never had any contact tracing and we still don't. That's always been just fake. No. It's, uh, well, if yeah. there's one thing people can do, it is get a booster and wear a better mask. Yeah. And N95 masks are cheap, relatively speaking. And uh, even the disposable ones can be reworn multiple oh, yeah. times. So yeah. even though they, they, they say the packaging might say disposable and to be worn no longer than eight hours, um, Testing has shown that they, the masks will continue to perform at their rated standard for longer than eight hours of, of wear. Yeah, yeah. One might be able to wear one through by rotating through multiple masks, different days of the week. One can wear a mask for many, many hours without any degradation in performance. And I see almost no one wearing an N95 mask in around san francisco i'll see maybe mm. a couple of people a day wearing n95 so it's got to be like one percent of all san franciscans mm. are wearing n95s boy i bought like 50 n95 mask kn95s for like 40 30 bucks they're not expensive at all yes well, and they can, last forever <laughs> well kn95s are no good no the kn95s the only difference is the ears no the problem with kn95s is the standards okay Mm -hmm. But there's no way to authenticate the quality of manufacture. Yeah, and I suppose. there are a couple of people who have lay people who have taken upon themselves to buy equipment and test KN95 masks. And mm -hmm. they have found that uh, the vast majority of them do not meet the KN95 standard. They are grossly uh, def well deficient. They mm. They're basically knockoffs, like so many things you buy on Amazon. Yep. Well, so okay. the, now, the, the answer is to buy N95 masks because the regulations around N95 masks are stricter. Well, you know, the best thing is to get what Caitlin's got. You get one of these, what painters get, this, this rubber mask with like two big filters. Those are like P100s or something. Yeah, the elastomeric ones are really good, except there's no filtration of the exhale valve. Yeah, you gotta you gotta sort of mod it so you can um, 
with like an external N95 around the, the, ex, the exhale valve. <clears throat> so you can filter that as well. So there's some modding that's needed. But if you do that, yeah, you, you are very protected. Yeah. yeah the, but the issue there is um, they're probably not going to let you on a flight wearing that. It might be a problem wearing that in stores in San Francisco, too. I don't find anybody enforcing any COVID regulations in San Francisco. They don't make me show vaccine cards. I really don't care about anything. Well, uh, speaking of elastomeric respirators with filters, there is now, uh, there are two products now that have built-in proper filters. There's the MSA Safety Advantage 200 LS, and it has a filter built into the exhale valve. Um, and there's also an add-on to uh, the 3M 6500 mask, which um, you, you buy aftermarket and then and then screw on. So you, you can upgrade you can upgrade uh, just a few elastomeric respirators with proper exhale valve uh, filters too now. All right. Well, okay. Anyway, so then um, this one I was amazed. They found a galaxy with no dark matter. And they didn't believe it. So they've been trying to verify it with more detailed tests. They found it really is true. A galaxy with no dark matter. People don't even understand how it could possibly form that way. So I suppose what really happened is it formed and something removed the dark matter. Um, but anyway, that was pretty exciting. And um, I've been getting deeper and deeper into cryptocurrency. Um, first, I did Lightning Network and wrote it up for my students, which is very interesting. See, now, I didn't know it was this bad. Ethereum transaction fees are now up to like $75. So it's just ridiculous. But Bitcoin transaction fees are only $5, which is not too bad. But the problem with Bitcoin is it takes an hour for a transaction to happen. So you make the lightning network that moves uh, data off chain. You do one transaction from the Bitcoin blockchain into the lightning network, which then transacts it off chain really fast and very low fees. And you only have to pay a transaction fee when you bring it back onto the chain, when you resolve these exchange uh, side networks, and it really works. So I wrote up projects for my students based, there's a very good podcast about the Lightning Network from Coindesk. And it was very interesting to hear about, and it really works. And this is what they're trying to do in El Salvador. You can really use Bitcoin to make micro payments like less than a penny, and it doesn't, the fee is not too large, and it is instantaneous. So it's really very nice. And Ethereum, another huge problem with Ethereum is that the blockchain cannot not handle very many transactions per second. So it just bogs down every time anything gets popular. And so um, Vitalik Buterin has announced Ethereum 2.0. And this is kind of madness. Ethereum 2.0 is coming presumably in about a year and it's going to use proof of stake instead of proof of work. And Vitalik Buterin explains that will mean it will be much less decentralized. It will really be just a small number of whales staking large amounts of Ethereum for the privilege of, of uh, processing the transactions and getting a fee. So you kind of wonder, why is it even a blockchain at all? You could just be Visa and have one central authority doing the work and you'd have the same thing. So anyway, like you say, this is why, you know, the people with a bad attitude like David Girard will say all this blockchain stuff is nonsense and shouldn't exist at all. And that's probably true. But I realized, I was thinking about it last night, like, why am I finally on this? This is just a game. It's a mathematical game. It's a puzzle like a CTF. How would you make your own banking system all out of computers and math? Not because there's any actual purpose to it, <laughs> but it's an interesting puzzle. Anyway, it is a very interesting puzzle and I'm, I'm getting involved in understanding it. And there's an incredible amount of money flying around in for no good reason, really. All the projects that come out of it are just absurd and could be more easily done another way. But if you put that out of your mind and just think of it as a game, it becomes easier to understand and appreciate. Anyway, this is the one that I want Caitlin to explain. DARPA has created a warp bubble. What is this nonsense? <laughs> Yeah, so, so with all mainstream science articles, you sort of have to take this with a bit of a grain of salt. I think a little more than that. Yes, What's yes. going on here? Yes. So the debrief has an article uh, written by Christopher Plain talking about, yes, uh, a first identified warp bubble. So 
what happened is kind of interesting. Um, there's a NASA warp drive specialist, uh, or former specialist, I guess he's working at DARPA now, uh, called Dr. Harold White. And Harold White, Dr. White, um, no relation to, to Clue, Clue fame, um, uh, was working on Casimir cavities over at DARPA and just happened to be, you know, taking uh, measurements and found something really interesting. And because of his work on uh, being a warp drive specialist, he, in this, he immediately recognized like, wait a minute, this looks like a warp bubble that I've just created, a very microscopic, nanoscopic even warp bubble, but a warp bubble nonetheless created, you know, by these Casimir cavities. Well, um, the Casimir force is a real interatomic force, right? That yes. bonds metal together in certain circumstances. Right. So the idea is that if you have like two plates yeah. very close to each other, the, uh, the um, uh, some of the waves, you know, can't manifest in that in that closed space. So it creates sort of like this like negative pressure on the outside of the two plates that like pushes them together. Um, and uh, doing and just the way he had it set up just happened to look exactly like uh, what one would think a warp bubble would look like. What is a warp bubble? So a warp bubble is uh, so Al Kibir um, um, uh, created or proposed something. So yeah, uh, Miguel Al Kibir proposed a mathematical warp drive, which is to say it is exactly like you would think in Star Trek, where you have the warping of, of space time to propel uh, a spacecraft uh, forward, potentially even faster than light. I heard about this and I assumed he was just a lunatic. Is there any actual reality to this? Well, the lunatic part comes from the fact that in order to make something like that, you would pretty much need all the energy in the universe um, and, and to make it go. Uh, but further studies have shown that it's actually possible with far less energy than all the energy in the universe, like maybe the energy of, you know, destroying Jupiter. How, <laughs> um, how, did, how did this guy do it? Um, so that's the big question. Like I said, this was an ex this appears to be sort of an accidental discovery. We don't, you know, more research and papers need to be written. I haven't seen the actual write up, but they, the, the, one of the world's top warp drive specialists is saying, hey, oops, we, we accidentally made a warp bubble. And this is funny, too, because he's like one of the only people in the world who could recognize such a thing. So what and he has done is he's make a little microscopic thing of a few atoms that has an unusual energy profile, right? Pretty much, yes. Uh, an okay. energy profile that resembles a, a warp drive, a warp okay. bubble. And so maybe it will be useful as a new particle to build transistors out of or something. I, I, I doubt that, but... Um, what I'm really hoping for, um, it, it's still unknown whether or not a warp bubble can propel something faster than, than light or do anything like that. However, if we can develop this technology into even like a microscopic level, so we can put a little small object in that bubble and propel it around, uh, even at sublight speeds, having a reactionless engine to move around the solar system would be a huge step forward. So you could make a gun. Well, a, a gun that can move and change direction in space so that if you wanted to, for example, uh, send a probe mm -hmm. to a small probe to like Jupiter and then have it go all the way around the Oort, Oort, Oort cloud and, you know, then go back to Saturn. I mean, you just have pretty much an infinite amount of Delta V. You just need to have solar panels or something. It doesn't need an engine. That's the, that, well, that's the, it, it, the warp drive in and of itself is the engine. So um, the idea is that you don't propel, you don't have, you don't have like a fuel tank mm. in order to move around. So even, even if, even if this ends up not giving us faster than light travel, which is sort of the pipe dream long and, you know, hundreds or if not thousands of years in the future, even if we can just use it as a scooter long, just even very slowly, the fact that the, it's not expelling any um, uh, any fuel would be a huge boon to space travel. So, yeah, well, I remember cold fusion. They found at Brigham Young about forty years ago. The most likely result is they'll just figure out that he's wrong. 
I, that's what I'm imagining too. I, th I think that, that, yeah. But, you know, it is, it is, if this does turn out to be an actual, you know, little warp bubble and we can manifest these things, you know, new technologies will come about. And even if it's not the promised, you know, Star Trek utopian future that we're all hoping for, you know, even, even side uh, projects can be extremely useful from this. So. Yeah. And you could, of course, use it to make miniature black holes and destroy the world. Anyway. I, I mean, I wasn't going to say anything, but. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, all right. All right. And so Alan has got, uh, oh yeah, the Israeli spyware again. Yes, there's news that's uh, just come out from Reuters. A couple of uh, uh, journalists, Christopher Bing and Joseph Men, have broken the story in Reuters about, according to sources in the U.S. government, um, U.S. diplomats in Uganda had their phones hacked with NSO group malware. And at least nine U.S. State Department employees in Uganda had their phones hacked in Uganda by parties unknown. Uh, and this was ongoing over several months. And this happened uh, before the US levied the sanctions or put in the NSO group on the, the uh, naughty list. Um, and yeah. so uh, presumably, this is what spurred the US to take action against the NSO group is that uh, they discovered that their phones were being targeted by um, perhaps the Ugandan government, perhaps somebody else using NSO group uh, malware. Well, I think it's abundantly clear that the NSO's promise that they only sell it to good people is nonsense. They'll sell it to anybody. And I think ah. they're pretty much going down. Oh, uh, at this point, yes. And now the NSO group in the past has said that they won't... Um, allow their malware to be used against any phones that have a, a, a US phone number. But these phones had a, a, a phone number for a different country. Mm -hmm. So I guess they weren't easily identifiable. And apparently the NSO group isn't really keeping tabs on what their customers do with their malware, which I guess gives them some plausible de deniability. It probably does, yeah. But actually, I'm, I know... Um... I read Nicole Perloff being quite excited about this because her big thing is cyber war and cyber weapons. And we're beginning to consider, you know, somehow regulating the trade in cyber weapons. Yeah. Which has been just pretty much a wild west so far. Well, of course, the U.S. is one of the um, one of the main offenders or one of the main uh, users. of. Cyber yeah, we war. create it. We hoard it. We lose it and let it get used against us. Yes. We're uh, we're. We're definitely involved. Yeah, which I'll be talking about in my next article. Okay, all right. And so back here, um, so another issue that we all lacked for decades, I've heard people say this, is we're gonna have some kind of cybersecurity rules for gadgets. And the UK is gonna try now, having IoT security rules that you must obey to be IoT and smartphones. Like at least you can't have a default password and you do have to report vulnerabilities promptly. So we'll see. You have to have to report vulnerabilities and actually patch them when people report them and stuff. So that would be swell if that's actually what happens. But, uh, and this one, Elon, now people are manufacturing electric cars. Quite a few people are. And now quite a few of them are making hydrogen powered cars. And the idea is you got an electric car, you've got a battery, but if your battery goes flat, you can't keep, doing your trip because you can't just gas it up like a normal car. Although I heard decades ago, people said you should just have a stock of fresh batteries and trade batteries. But for some reason, nobody's going for that. What they're going for is a hydrogen powered car where you use the hydrogen to run a generator to charge the battery, which sounds kind of insane, but that's what they're doing. And Elon Musk says, this is terrible. Don't waste your time. This is wrong. This is the wrong way to make an electric car, but other car manufacturers are making them. So then there'll be a pressure to create hydrogen fueling stations all over the place. And we'll see how well that works out. But uh, it would be cleaner, of course. But uh, anyway, that's I have heard of these hydrogen powered cars and some of them are finally coming out. So we'll see if that's a real competitor for electric and gas. Anyway, and Caitlin has figured out why it's so difficult to secure chips. Well, actually, no, I haven't. <laughs> um, so there's an article um, by semiconductorengineering.com 
uh, let's see who is it by. It's by Ed uh, Sperling, good old Ed. Uh, so what does Ed have to say? Basically, uh, chip manufacturers know that there's a problem. So uh, for a long time, attacks on chips were mostly thought of as sort of this theoretical attack that no one or very few people might do. You like know, might Spectre and Meltdown? I like Spectre and Meltdown or side channel attacks, stuff like that. A row hammer. Yeah, yeah. Um, and it's becoming more and more prevalent. And, you know, as software security has increased, a lot of hackers are now looking at the hardware itself to hack. And unfortunately, the defenses on the, on the hardware side are just slow or, and not really coming along. And so this article asks, why is that? And it turns out building security into the chips themselves is hard and if not impossible to really do, you know, perfectly. Um, it, it's like asking someone to, to build a software product that does not have any bugs, which is just not going to happen. And, you know, there's really no guideline for how to do, how to build security properly into these products. In particular, you have so many different kinds of silicon based uh, products. So you, you not only have, you know, CPUs, you have other devices connected to those CPUs, you have different types of CPUs. So you have CPUs that are, you know, general purpose, like x86, and then you might have a general purpose risk processor, and then you might have specialty processors and microcontrollers and stuff used in medical applications, and all those require different levels, or, and then you might have military-based processors, and all those have different levels of security needed. And when you add security, you sometimes take features away, like speed, like it might slow down the processor that it's running faster. And so this becomes a huge problem. And I just can't do it is basically what they're saying. <laughs> um, may, maybe in like 20 or 30 years, we'll have you know, secure processes in place and we'll know how to do it. But in the meantime, this is just a wide open field for people to have fun and do very legal and uh, ethical activities with their electronics well so it's the same as like the internet we we just find holes and patch them and report them and patch them and have layers of patches you know what else can you do well with how do you patch a piece of hardware though well you change this firmware around it to protect it until you can upgrade the hardware and then you go to the next generation of hardware which has a different set of bugs that's what we're doing i mean you would you would assume that that firmware alone can can solve all these problems but well, probably not all of them, but you yeah. can help somewhat. I mean, that's what we've been doing in Spectre and Meltdown. We're still using Spectre and Meltdown vulnerable chips. We're just putting defenses on the outside. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I mean, this is the this is like uh, the whole internet is like you're riding on a leaky ship and all you're doing is patching the holes and new holes appear and you patch them and you keep going if you can. So maybe we should all just switch to FPGA based technology spend 10 times much on our, our chips, but then we can completely patch them when a vulnerability is discovered. And then we can have viruses going in them. <laughs> yeah, we can have, that's one of the things that I was, that's the theoretical ideas that's been going around in my mind for a while is creating viruses and malware specifically to change the architecture of PGAs. That would seem like the obvious thing to do. Yep. All right, a real root kit. All right, and Alan has got uh, the military acting against these ransomware groups. Yes, uh, General Paul Nakasone, who is the head of the U.S. Cyber Command and the NSA, has now acknowledged that the U.S. government was responsible for the hacks on the R Evil or Revil uh, malware group that was responsible for so many of the, the major hacks of the past year, such as the Colonial Pipeline attack. Didn't we announce that at the time or were we just guessing? Well, no, it was, it, well, it was acknowledged that the US government had some kind of role in it, but they didn't get into any specifics. And they so actually stole the, the money back though. Are they explaining yes, how they did that? That too, that too, right. But this is the first time that uh, the head of US Cyber Command has been so explicit in saying we did yeah. this, we yeah. were responsible for it. So it, it's no news and yet it is news. Well, publicly admitting it is probably a signal to our enemies, mainly yes. Russia, I think. Yes, that, that's absolutely true. And it also indicates that the US uh, government is now willing to take a much more active role in hacking back 
which has been a controversial idea in cybersecurity circles. But this is the US government hacking back, not private entities or companies. Yeah. So um, hopefully they know what they're doing. Um, but it all, he, the general also <laughs> signaled in this interview that the US is going to continue doing this kind of thing. Uh, and that uh, it's now viewed as a matter of uh, security. It's not just yeah. a, a, a commercial uh, issue or economic issue. It's a matter of national security. And so the U.S. is going to be doing this consistently moving forward. Yeah, I think the cyber war is heating up into more and yes. more of a, an open conflict. All right. And uh, so let's see, I got one more. Yeah, uh, this one I thought was kind of amazing. Someone uh, did a detail, NPR did a detailed study and they showed that your death rate from COVID is determined more than anything else by your political party, because that determines whether you get vaccinated. And they found that the um, people who, the highest 10% blue counties have six times less COVID deaths than the highest Republican counties. And so it is just amazing. You know, we've, uh, in America, if you're Republican, you have a very chan low chance of getting vaccinated and a very high chance of dying of COVID. And if you're very democratic, like San Francisco, everybody is very, very careful. It's uh, much more like a religious or cultural divide where we have seriously just different customs and worldviews than just like two political parties that kind of agree about what the world is and have some difference in how we should uh, fix our problems. So this is totally not healthy. But anyway, it's, it's, it's interesting to see real numbers and statistics verifying what we sort of imagined anecdotally. I know in the early days of getting shots, this was the way you could get a shot is just drive to a red county because nobody will take it there. <laughs> anyway, and uh, the last one is Alan's got another one about Russian activity. Yes, Mandian has a nice report on um, suspected Russian activity targeting government and business entities around the globe. And uh, this is on the one year anniversary of the SolarWinds supply chain attack. So uh, apparently the group responsible for the SolarWinds attack, i.e. Russia, um, has continued to be very active and has uh, leveraged some of the knowledge gained and some of the refinements of technique TTPs uh, from that attack and have continued their work uh, with fewer headlines. And well, so, they're still inside, right, from solar winds. They put right. in back doors. And we probably haven't cleaned them all out. Yeah, right, right. <laughs> they're in there for good now. Um, and so this is just a good summary of what's going on uh, and, and uh, the, the methods of these attackers. Yeah, getting rid of somebody once an APT is in there is not easy. And I highly doubt that very many victims have succeeded. No, and their infrastructure is, is very sophisticated. Um, so, and they have, you know, good OPSEC and all that. So it's, it's, it's very hard. Yep. Yep. All right. Well, that's it for this one. And we'll be back on Friday. I've got to hit the right button. No, that's the wrong button. There's the right button.